Thanks for joining us. It's Wednesday, the 8th of March, and uh, we are in chapter 25 of uh, Christopher Watkins' Biblical Critical Theory. And um, this is the chapter Eschatolo Eschatology and Apocalyptic. Um, there are four chapters uh, dealing with eschatology, and we're going to do them the next four days, and then that will wrap up our treatment of uh, Watkins' book. Um, the questions at the end of the chapter. Um, a friend is reading through the book of Revelation and grumbles wildly symbols. John should just say what he means. What would you reply? Uh, next one, look at the descriptions of the prostitute and the beast as they're described in the chapter. What adjectives would you use to capture the regime John is depicting? To what extent do you see these same adjectives describing our current situation in late modernity? How is the New Jerusalem different to Babylon? List and comment on the contrasts you can find. And how does the figure of the martyr in Revelation help Christians to orientate themselves in these last days? Watkin confesses at the start of the chapter that he is notoriously bad at um, working at the end of the plot when he's reading, a, a, watching a movie or reading a book. Um, but he says, here we have the end of the plot of the Bible narrative. And um, it's the genre of apocalyptic um, revelation, disclosure, appearing, manifestation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, how he's revealed in all his glory and how he reveals the hidden realities of earthly societies and cultures. Um, then he talks about um, the book of Revelation. Really, the first half of the chapter is an introduction to, well, really the genre of the book of Revelation. Um, it's dripping with symbolism. Um, the symbols have a surplus of sense. One symbol can have multiple meanings, drifting between them in intentionally ambiguous ways. Um, of course, the big one for Watkin, and the big one in the book itself, is the portrayal of the two cities, the city of Babylon and the city of Jerusalem. The identity of Babylon, well, it's clear and vague, says uh, Watkin, its location on seven hills, as well as the description of the goods in which it trades, make it unmistakably the symbol of Rome. But Babylon's condemnation also contains elements of the Old Testament prophecies against Babel, Sodom, Egypt, Tyre, and Edom. I'm just following Watkin here. Um, he, he is interested um, in this, uh, the whole metaphor of the trade through the symbol of the prostitute, uh, picking up on Oliver, Oliver O'Donovan, Babylon uses trade like a fornication, a cultural promiscuity that exploits and drains the resources of the surrounding nations. Uh, its promiscuous control of markets is a tool of empire that amounts to the surrendering of individual integrity in an undisciplined and destructive form of commerce. Um, he, he speaks about Babylon being a call to cultural uh, disengagement and, uh, and then moves on to the positive alternative of Jerusalem and martyrdom. When he comes to martyrdom, um, there's, uh, there's an interesting, well I say, he, he, he has, um, I suppose, a diagonalization. Um, on the one hand, he says, don't go the way of Eusebianism, where um, Eusebian, the fourth century bishop of uh, Caesarea, he sought to harmonize Christianity with Roman political life and advocated for the use of political force by the religious or secular majority, and that those two were much the same for him, um, against individual dissenters. Um, or on the other hand, the Donatists, who split from the, uh, the Roman church in the fourth century, and they argued for a, ro a religious community rigorously separated from Roman life and bent on confrontation with it. Watkin says, the difference is that while a martyr makes a statement out of his or her death, a suicide bomber makes a weapon out of hers. Martyrdom in life and where necessary in death provides Christians with a blueprint that avoids both Celia of Eusebian and Shabalus of Donatus isolation. It's a blueprint for how to live in Babylon as a citizen of Jerusalem. Um, he notes that Rome had no problem with I am the way, the truth, and the life, um, but it executes those who add, no one comes to the Father but through me. We then get to uh, the apocalyptic wrath and hell um, as we, we head to the end of the chapter. Um, I, um, I parted company with Watkin in this section. Um, Watkin was following Miroslav Wolf, who seemed to be arguing, um, well, he says, the Christian who pays attention to Revelation cannot argue that God is non-violent, but they must be equally firm in holding two further points. One, this is a righteous violence, 
bringing evil to a final end, and two, where nowhere in the book of Revelation are human beings invited to participate in this violence. It's the prerogative of God and God alone. And, I mean, I just remember doing work on Revelation and being persuaded, yes, I would not take up arms to defend the gospel, um, because, of course, God is able to defend himself. It's not my place to take up arms to defend the gospel. However, I would take up arms to defend my wife, to defend my country. Um, and so I thought he, I, I just thought he went a little bit too far on that point. You might disagree with me, and, and that's fine. I did like um, a little paragraph here just before the end of the chapter to the objection level that Christians, that you cannot accept me as an equal citizen if you believe I'm going to hell and that we should reply to them, I can treat you as an equal citizen because God will judge. If perfect justice needs to be done now, I must either violate all standards of justice by not judging you at all, or judge you now in the most dogmatic way. But if I know that final judgment belongs to the Lord, then I can love you as my neighbour now. Uh, and to the argument that divine violence demands human violence, Wolf argues that the creator-creature distinction, uh, although he doesn't use that term, issues in precisely the opposite effect. Um, there's a lovely finish to this chapter on the issue of superabundance. Nowhere is there any dramatic showdown between God and the devil at the end of Revelation. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire without so much as saying a word or lifting a finger in self-defense. The devil is accorded no final monologue. Faced with the absolute power of the almighty creator of heaven and earth, he is tossed away like a dirty rag. Um, really interesting chapter that's eschatology, eschatology, eschatology and the apocalyptic and uh, next up in daily bible time from Watkins book we're going to be thinking about eschatology and time thanks for joining us this Wednesday see you tomorrow morning